Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a peach bellini, and on this week's episode, we are starting this theme month, which will focus on international cases. This one comes to us from the United Kingdom and has inspired movies, television shows, and music. We will be looking at the case of the acid bath murderer, John Hay. John George Hay was born in Stamford, Lincolnshire, England, on July 24, 1909, to John and Emily Hay. He was raised in a conservative Protestant sect called Plymouth Brethren. Hay claimed that his upbringing caused him to have recurring nightmares throughout his childhood. Despite this, he found enjoyment in classical music and often enjoyed attending concerts. This interest in music led to Hay being awarded a scholarship to Queen Elizabeth Grammar School and then to Wakefield Cathedral. He would become a choir boy at school, and after school, he apprenticed for a firm of motor engineers. He left that job after a year and started selling insurance. He was fired from this job after being accused of stealing money. He then started forging car documents. On July 6, 1934, Hay married Patrice Betty Hammer. This marriage did not last long. The same year, he was jailed for fraud. Betty gave birth to their child and placed the child up for adoption and left Hay. Hay was ostracized from his conservative family after the failure of his marriage. In 1936, Hay moved to London and started working for William McSwan. McSwan was the owner of several successful amusement arcades. Hay, in addition to being a chauffeur, he also maintained the arcade machine. While working for Mick Swan, Hay pretended to be a solicitor named William Caddo Anderson. He sold fraudulent stock shares that he claimed were from the estates of dead clients. His scam was only uncovered after a misspelled name on an official letterhead. He was sentenced to four years in jail. He continued to commit various frauds and was sent to jail several other times. After this multiple imprisonment, he started thinking about and regretting that he left his victims alive. He learned about French murderer Georges Alexandre Sarre. Sarre disposed of his victims' bodies using sulfuric acid. Hay experimented with rodents and discovered it took after 30 minutes for the body to dissolve. In 1943, Hay was released from another prison term. He started working as an accountant at an engineering firm. He then bumped into his former employer, William McSwan, at a Kensington pub. McSwan introduced Hay to his parents, Donald and Amy. Hay observed the McSwan's lifestyle and became envious. On September 6, 1944, McSwan disappeared. In later testimony, Hay recounted the following events. Hay lured McSwan to the basement of a property on Gloucester Road. He then hit him on the head with a lead pipe and placed his body in a 48-gallon drum with concentrated sulfuric acid. After two days, the body was mostly dissolved and Hay dumped what remained in a manhole. Hay told McSwan's parents that he went into hiding in Scotland to avoid military service. Hay then started living in McSwan's house and collecting rent for McSwan's parents. When World War II ended and their son had not returned, Donald and Amy became worried. On July 2nd, 1945, Hay lured Donald and Amy McSwan to the same basement that he lured their son. He told them that their son was back from Scotland for a surprise visit. He then killed them with blunt force trauma and disposed of their bodies. Hay then stole the McSwan's pension checks and sold their property. He moved to Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington. Hay had developed a gambling issue. By 1947, he ran out of money. He decided to rob and kill another couple in order to get out of his financial troubles. He decided on Archibald Henderson and his wife, Rose. The Hendersons were selling a house and Hay expressed interest in it. Hay was invited to the flat by Rose to play the piano for their housewarming party. While there, Hay stole Archibald's revolver. Hay rented a workshop in West Sussex and moved the acid and drums from Gloucester Road to the new location. 
On February 12th, 1948, Hay drove Archibald to his workshop to supposedly show him a new invention. When they entered, Hay shot Archibald in the head. He lured Rose to the workshop claiming Archibald got sick. When she arrived, he shot her as well. He disposed of their bodies in the oil drums filled with acid. He forged their signatures and sold all of their possessions for 8,000 pounds, which is over 100,000 pounds in today's money. He kept their car and dog. The final victim was Olive Durand Deacon. She was a wealthy widow and resided at Onslow Court Hotel, which is where Hay was still residing. Hay was still calling himself an engineer, and Olive had an idea for artificial fingernails. Hay then took Olive to his workshop on February 18, 1949. Once there, he shot her in the back of the head and put her in an acid bath. Her friend Constance Lane reported her missing two days later. When detectives started investigating, they discovered Hayes' history of fraud and searched the workshop. They found a dry cleaner's receipt for Olive's Persian coat and papers that referenced the Hendersons and McSwans. The workshop did not have a drain like Gloucester Road, so Hay had to dispose of the remains by pouring out the containers on the back of the property. When pathologist Keith Simpson examined the area, he found 28 pounds of human remains, part of a human foot, human gallstones, and part of a denture. The dentures were later matched to Olive by her dentist. Hay was brought in for questioning. After asking the detectives about escaping from a high-security psychiatric facility, he confessed to the murders of the Hendersons, McSwans, and Duran Deacon. He also confessed to killing three other people, including a young man called Max, an Eastbourne girl, and a Hammersmith woman. The last three murders could not be proven. At his trial, Hay pleaded insanity and stated he drank the blood of his victims. He said since he was a young boy, he drank of blood. The attorney general urged the jury to reject the insanity plea, arguing that Hay had showed premeditation. Hay believed that if the bodies of his victims could not be found, then a murder conviction was not possible. This was incorrect, and the jury found him guilty. He was sentenced to death, and on August 10, 1949, John Hay was executed by executioner Albert Pierrepoint. Hay's crime went on to inspire episodes of crime shows, including Criminal Minds, A for Asset, and The Black Museum. The stage plays Under the Red Moon and Wax drew inspiration from Hay's story. Hay's story even crossed over into music. Thrash and death metal band Macabre wrote a song entitled Acid Bath Vampire, while stoner doom band Church of Misery titled their song about John, Make Them Die Slowly. Jenny, what are your thoughts on John Hay, the acid bath murderer? I had not heard of him or this case beforehand. And what a evil person really just killing. Well, we know that money is a big reason people kill, but I feel like for a serial killer killing for money maybe isn't as common. I don't know. I feel like I don't hear about that as much in modern serial killers, at least just doing it out of jealousy and as part of a scam, really, which is interesting to me. It just makes me so sick hearing about the acid, and I know we're going to talk about that more, but I've just definitely seen plenty of, like, Dateline stories and other, like, true crime shows where people did use acid for various things. I mean, I guess it it was smart for him to do at the time, and he definitely, like we said, thought he wasn't going to be found guilty because he, you know, you couldn't find the bodies, but that's not the case. Like, we'll also talk about His plea of insanity, too, is really interesting, and I'm kind of glad that back then people could see through it. We've talked a lot about like criminal psychology and how it was formed, and I I feel like that kind of goes into it, the saying – I mean, he was basically saying he was crazy, and – they didn't really seem to believe him, which is good. And we've seen that in other cases too. I don't think it's any we've talked about where people are trying to like make themselves seem worse off. So I guess they can avoid execution or a more brutal punishment. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I feel so terrible for his victims who truly seemed like they were duped and just 
very innocent people. What do you think? Yeah, this is one of those cases where it's definitely unique in the way he went about it. Because like you said, serial killers usually don't have a strong financial motive. Definitely not primarily financial motive when it comes to these crimes. But I think it's interesting that the reason that he turned into a killer was because he kept getting caught and the different fraud and scam cases that he was involved in and was just like, okay, well, I need to kill my victims. And then he got inspiration from another killer in terms of why he started to use asset. And of course, the misconception that he had with not getting caught. One of the things that kind of makes the hair stand up for this is the music that was inspired by this case. I know we talked about before about like murderbilia and like the different things that people do to remember like different serial killers. To me, this is on just another level because this is not as simple as, oh, I'm putting someone's face on a t-shirt. This is making a whole song where you are describing and finding inspiration from someone that killed multiple people. I find that to be gross, especially when you're naming songs called Make Them Die Slowly. Like, what was going on in your head to make you think that that was okay? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's definitely off-putting. I agree with you. I'm happy that the insanity plea didn't work. I think that at this point, people kind of roll their eyes at people pleading insanity because it's kind of like the thing that you do where you plead insanity, you say things that you think will aid in it. But a lot of people are able to see through it. A lot of people are able to examine the evidence and see that while you're claiming to be insane now, you were buying the oil drums, you were buying the asset, you were doing things to conceal your crimes, even going as far as killing someone's parents to cover up the fact that you killed their child. That definitely doesn't sound like something someone would do if they were in a manic uh, state or insane. It just doesn't make any sense. And he was definitely justly prosecuted for what he did to people. I'm glad you did mention the songs because as you were saying them out loud, like the, my ears were definitely like, oh, this is so weird. And I'm curious to listen to the songs because they do, I, like you said, the John Make Them Die Slowly is such a foul name. But I wonder if there's any, you know, like we hear like, oh, it's a song about him. I wonder if it's glorifying him or I'm interested to see like what the lyrics are. I'll have to look them up. I'll report back to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely, like, from his perspective, like, the Make Them Die Slowly song, they're doing it from the first-person perspective uh, to give, like, a little hint to how, like, the song is formulated. Like Hay, many people have the misconception that a body is required for a murder conviction. It started with the case of Campton Wonder. A man had vantage, and eventually three people were hanged for his murder. Two years later, the man returned. He told a story about being kidnapped and enslaved in Turkey. In the 20th century, a similar case sparked interest in the notion that no body means no conviction. Mamie Stewart disappeared in 1919, and her husband was charged despite the overwhelming amount of circumstantial evidence that she might not have been dead. In 1951, New Zealand criminal George Cecil Horry was convicted of the murder of his wife, although her body was never found. There are more recent examples. In April of 1994, Heidi Allen, 18, of New Haven, New York, was abducted from the convenience store where she worked. Her body has never been found. Brothers Gary and Richard Thurbado were charged with kidnapping and murder. They were tried separately. Gary was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life while Richard was acquitted. In 2002, Gurley Chu Hoffenscroft, husband, and his mistress were convicted of her murder, which occurred in 1999. Hoffenscroft's remains have never been located. 
In 2007, in Omaha, Nebraska, Christopher Edwards was convicted of murdering his girlfriend, Jessica O'Grady, whose body has never been found. His mattress was soaked with her blood. In 2008, Hans Reiser was convicted of the first-degree murder of his wife, Nina Reiser. After conviction and before sentencing, he pled guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for disclosing the location of his wife's body. Jenny, what do you think about the misconception that a body is needed for a murder conviction? And do you agree with prosecuting people for murder with just circumstantial evidence? It's tough because... I don't think that a body is always needed. I feel like in some cases, there really is enough circumstantial evidence or other evidence. I mean, physical evidence either to prove that someone killed someone, maybe like blood, the victim's blood in the person's car. Like we said, the blood on the mattress, hairs found in the person's home when they had like no connection to this person whatsoever, things like that. So I know it's like a tough case to prove when there is not a body, but I think it definitely is necessary in a lot of cases. And I'm glad, I guess in more modern times, we've expanded our minds to think about that. When it comes to prosecuting someone for murder when it's like only circumstantial evidence, I don't necessarily agree with that. It's hard because, of course, there are cases where it was circumstantial evidence and people were guilty. But then there we've talked about how many cases on here and even just now where people were innocent and then they were executed for no reason or they lost 25, 30 plus years of their life to being in jail when they did not commit a crime. I think it's hard. I think for me, what gets me is more physical evidence And I don't know, if I was a prosecutor, I would feel more confident going to trial if we had a majority of physical evidence, hard evidence versus circumstantial evidence. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. I think that because of how many wrongful convictions we've seen, whatever evidence is presented, it needs to be extremely strong. And it needs to be the type of evidence where later on, you're not going to find that you made a critical error. Definitely, the state of the crime scene makes, it's an important factor. Like the case where the mattress was soaked in blood. Well, if you're seeing someone's entire blood volume on a mattress, I think that it's reasonable, even if you don't have a body, to know that that person is likely deceased. But if it's just, well, the person went missing and this person sent a nasty text message and had, you know, motive, I don't think that is strong enough evidence to completely ruin someone's life and jail them. I do think it's interesting that some people still believe that you need a body for a murder conviction. And honestly, I think it's good that you don't need a body because unfortunately, I think that if a criminal potential murderer hears that, all they're really going to hear is, well, all I need to do is effectively hide the body and then I can get away with this. And I definitely don't think that's a society that we want to live in. So. While on the face of it, I'm fine with a murder conviction without a body. Again, you definitely need a strong amount of evidence that whatever happened to the person, they would not be able to survive. Or I think that you should charge someone with a lesser offense in that case versus going for a full murder conviction. I definitely agree with going for the lesser offense. Because of the destructive nature of acid, it has been used as a weapon, especially against women. A form of violent assault involving the act of throwing acid or a similarly corrosive substance onto the body of another, quote, with the intention to disfigure, maim, torture, or kill, end quote. Perpetrators of these attacks throw corrosive liquids at their victims, usually at their faces, burning them and damaging skin tissue 
often exposing and sometimes dissolving the bones. Acid attacks can lead to permanent, partial, or complete blindness. Acid attacks are reported in many parts of the world, though more commonly in developing countries. Between 1999 and 2013, a total of 3,512 Bangladeshi people were attacked with acid. In India, acid attacks are at an all-time high and increasing every year, with 250 to 300 reported incidents every year, while the, quote, actual number could exceed 1,000, according to Acid Survivors Trust International, end quote. The most notable effect of an acid attack is the lifelong bodily disfigurement. According to the Acid Survivors Foundation in Pakistan, there is a high survival rate amongst victims of acid attacks. Consequently, the victim is faced with physical challenges which require long-term surgical treatment, as well as psychological challenges which require in-depth intervention from psychologists and counselors at each stage of physical recovery. The medical effects of acid attacks are extensive. The severity of the damage depends on the concentration of the acid and the time before the acid is thoroughly washed off with water or neutralized with a neutralizing agent. The acid can rapidly eat away skin, the layer of fat beneath the skin, and in some cases even the underlying bone. Eyelids and lips may be completely destroyed and the nose and ears severely damaged. Acid Survivors Foundation, Uganda, findings included the skull is partly destroyed or deformed and cases of hair loss. Ear cartilage is usually partly or totally destroyed and deafness may occur. Eyelids may be burned off or deformed, leaving the eyes extremely dry and prone to blindness. Acid directly in the eyes also damages sight, sometimes causing blindness in both eyes. The nose can become shrunken and deformed. The nostrils may close off completely due to destroyed cartilage. The mouth becomes shrunken and narrow, and it may lose its full range of motion. Sometimes the lips may be partly or totally destroyed, exposing the teeth. Eating and speaking can become difficult. Scars can run down from the chin to the neck area, shrinking the chin and extremely limiting range of motion in the neck. Inhalation of acid vapors usually creates respiratory problems, exacerbating restricted airway pathways, which are the esophagus and nostrils, in acid patients. In addition to the above-mentioned medical effects, acid attack victims face the possibility of sepsis, kidney failure, skin depigmentation, and even death. Acid assault survivors face many mental health issues upon recovery. One study showed that when compared to published Western norms for psychological well-being, non-Caucasian acid attack victims reported higher levels of anxiety, depression, and scored higher on the Dairyford Appearance Scale, which measures psychological distress due to one's concern for their appearance. In addition to the medical and psychological effects, many social implications exist for acid survivors, especially women. For example, such attacks usually leave victims handicapped in some way, rendering them dependent on either their spouse or family for everyday activities, such as eating and running errands. These dependencies are increased by the fact that that many acid survivors are not able to find suitable work due to impaired vision and physical handicap. This negatively impacts their economic viability, causing hardships on the family and spouses that care for them. As a result, divorce rates are high, with abandonment by husbands found in 25% of acid assault cases in Uganda, compared to only 3% of wives abandoning their disfigured husbands. When acid contacts the skin, response time is crucial. If washed away with water or neutralized promptly, burns can be minimized or avoided entirely. However, areas unprotected by skin, such as the cornea of the eye or the lip, may be burned immediately on contact. Many victims are attacked in an area without immediate access to water or unable to see during to being blinded or forced to keep their eyes closed to prevent additional burns to the eye. Treatment for burn victims remains inadequate in many developing nations where incidents are high. These problems are exacerbated by a lack of knowledge on how to treat burns. 
Some victims have applied oil to the acid rather than rinsing thoroughly and completely with water for 30 minutes or longer to neutralize the acid. Such home remedies only serve to increase the severity of damage as they do not counteract the acidity. The intention of the attacker is often to humiliate rather than kill the victim. Motivations include personal conflict regarding intimate relationships and sexual rejection, sexual-related jealousy and lust, revenge for refusal of sexual advances, proposals of marriage and demands for dowry, gang violence and rivalry, conflicts over land ownership, farm animals, housing, and property. Many countries have begun pushing for legislation addressing acid attacks and a few have recently employed new laws against this crime. In 2002, Bangladesh introduced the death penalty for acid attacks and laws strictly controlling the sale, use, shortage, and international trade of acids. In Pakistan, the lower house of parliament unanimously passed the Acid Control and Acid Crime Prevention Bill on May 10, 2011. As punishment, according to the bill, individuals held responsible for acid attacks face harsh fines and life in prison. In 2013, India introduced an amendment to the Indian Penal Code through the Criminal Law Act 2013, making acid attacks a specific offense with a punishment of imprisonment not less than 10 years and which can extend to life imprisonment and with fine. Jenny, what are your thoughts on these attacks, and are there any other measures you think can be taken to reduce their occurrence? It really makes my blood boil. I didn't really know this was an issue until a few years ago. I think that's because it happened in the U.S., and it's not as common in the U.S. like we just talked about. So then I think it exposed a lot of people to what an issue this is around the world, and it just breaks my heart for these predominantly women that experience this, hearing the motivations, words can't describe how much it upsets me hearing about how this is what women have to deal with when we reject a man or even when maybe our family is in conflict over farm animals or land ownership. It's just so upsetting. It's clear, like we said, that it's to humiliate someone. And I think in a lot of these cases, we're looking at these people who are committing these crimes don't view women for more than just like their looks. And we hear that a lot, you know, that as a woman, your worth is really like in your appearance. So it's clear that they think, well, she's going to be nothing once I destroy her face or her looks, whatever. It's nice to see some change coming about in these countries. I think that's probably the biggest thing to make this a serious offense. I think definitely no less than 10 years, like the amendment India introduced and really like regulating who has access to these acids. Like I think we said Bangladesh is doing because really like average people shouldn't have access to stuff like this. But I also know that there are like a lot of household things that really can hurt you too. I don't know how common some of these acids, chemicals, whatnot are in other parts of the world, but I think that's part of it. And then I guess the other thing really to do is probably like better education. It's hard because I think so much of this is like a cultural thing and putting a certain value on men versus women and men's just... I guess men feeling like they have a right to a woman, like we were saying, like refusal of sexual advances, proposals of marriage, people rejecting them, thinking, okay, well, I had a right to her. She said no. And now I'm mad as hell and I'm going to take it out on her. Teaching people that that's not right. And of course, that's not something easy to do. But I think that in addition to what we're seeing happen is probably the only way this is going to go away or happen less often. What do you think? I agree with everything you said. I think that it's good that more people are becoming aware that this is a problem because a lot of times when it comes to issues that are not seen as much in the Western world, that sometimes we can become blind to it when it's something that women and some men in the developing world have been struggling with for decades. I think that 
it's definitely one of those attacks where we say it's a humiliation thing. It's not something where they want the person to die, but they want the person to live with the litany of negative effects that come with being a victim of an acid attack. I definitely think that one of the things that stood out as really sad was the divorce rate being so high. I mean, a quarter of women being divorced because of something that they had no control over is just heartbreaking. And the fact that they aren't able to reduce the harm caused by acid attack because of the social economic factors of where they are. And it's always disappointing where someone's recovery or access to care is determined by where they live, how much money they have. That's definitely not something that we want to see. The motivations don't surprise me, honestly. I think that when it comes to a lot of the crimes that happen against women by men, a lot of it can be boiled down to being rejected and getting angry about it and thinking that women are their possession and just this internal conflict that they go through when what they think are their possession is now rejecting them and not giving them what they want. So that doesn't really surprise me. What did surprise me, though, was the conflict over, like, property. Because when I think of, like, property conflicts, I definitely think of it from, like, the Western mindset of, like, well, you just take them to court. Like, you just take them to court, and that's what you do. But obviously, in these countries, that's not an easy solution. So people feel like they have to resort to violence and these extreme measures to get what they want. And a lot of times they're not even targeting the person that has done them wrong. They're targeting the woman of the family, which is definitely not something that we want to say. When it comes to other measures that can happen, honestly, I think these countries are doing what they can. It's obviously not the easiest crime to regulate. And there are definitely tons of moral and religious factors that go into it. So the fact that they're taking any steps is definitely great to see. And hopefully they're is a increased worldwide education and knowledge, like you said, about these attacks so that more resources can be given to the victim so that they're able to recover from them and really just regain their lives after a vicious attack happened to them. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the acid bath murderer. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. As always, stay safe.